Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 2N, where we're going to talk about the outcomes, the consequences of the gene duplications that we discussed in the previous lecture. We'll talk about whether gene duplications are good or bad for the organism in which they arise, and then we'll think about the longer-term evolutionary consequences of these events. For a gene duplication to have any evolutionary history at all, it has to be in a germline cell. Um, changes that arise in somatic cells are just lost because they're not passed into the gametes. It also has to be that the gene is intact. If the gene's broken, it's lost, it's a promoter, it's not really a gene duplication, it's a gene fragment. Now, assuming that we have a duplication that includes intact genes in germline cells, what are the immediate consequences likely to be? Well, could be that the consequences are bad, that now the organism which evolved to have one copy of this gene, now it's got two copies, and this means that the dosage of the gene product could be unbalanced. The cell may be making more of the gene product than is really good for it. The um, consequences of a gene duplication, much of the time, though, are likely to be neutral for the cell that it arises in, because um, in most cases, gene dosage is something that can be flexibly adjusted by regulation. And so it may be that really, it's not really having any big effect on the cell in which it happened or the organism in which it happened. But most interestingly, it could be that the duplication is good, that it's causing a useful increase in dosage, or even if it's immediately neutral, it may have a potential for evolving into new and improved functions. And you'll see that in the next slide. So here's a schematic. Here's our duplicated genes. And I've shown them as if they were on different chromosomes, but they could be on the same chromosome. It wouldn't matter. And the question that we ask is, well, are two copies of this gene better than one? If the answer is yes, then natural selection is going to favor maintaining both copies, and it's going to select against mutations, any mutation that causes a defect in one of the new copies will be selected against because it's beneficial to have two copies. But what if two copies aren't better than one? It still um, it doesn't have much immediate impact on the organism itself, but it creates the potential for the evolution of new gene functions in a couple of different ways. One possibility is that one copy will be selected to maintain the original function, but the other copy, perhaps because it initially suffered a mutation that caused it not to serve the original function, the other copy still retains most of the attributes of a functional gene. It's probably still got promoters, start codons, stop codons. And so this can quite easily, by mutation, diverge into a form that actually serves a new, probably related, function. So gene duplication creates the potential for a gene to diverge into a new function. Or it may be that both copies diverge, and rather than having one gene that serves this particular function, the cell now has two genes that are very similar but serve specialized subfunctions. So the two genes may have divided up the top of the original gene and be able to do it more efficiently because each is more specialized. So these are beneficial new gene consequences that can come from what's initially a neutral duplication of a gene. Now, an important term to be aware of is gene family. We use this term to describe situations where genes are related because of ancestral duplications or by copying into a new genome, which functionally does the same thing. And so I've got one example here, and this is the RecA family of genes. This is one of those families of genes that can be traced to all the groups of life and likely existed in the common ancestor of all living organisms. Um, 
it's in bacteria, it's in archaea, and in many organisms, especially many eukaryotes, there are multiple copies, multiple distantly related versions of the RecA gene. And we describe this as the RecA gene family. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different genes, genes with different names, all closely related to each other. And we know that they're closely related to each other because we can line them up and compare their amino acid sequences. And these amino acid sequences are much too similar to have arisen for the similarity to have arisen by chance. So we conclude that these similarities exist because of homology, that these are genes that are similar because they're descended from a distant common ancestor. Now, this is in humans, many of our metabolic genes and most of our structural and regulatory genes are members of gene families. It's very, very common. Now, one source of concern for understanding gene families is the need to distinguish between different alleles and different loci. You remember we introduced these terms in module one as describing different aspects of relationships between genes. So here I've got the same drawing of the human chromosomes that I showed in module one. There I was making the point that each of our chromosomes has a different set of genes. So chromosome one has completely different genes from chromosome two. Chromosome 18 has completely different genes from chromosome 19. They have different loci. Now, I want to focus on just one pair of one gene family that's present on two of our chromosomes, and that's the genes of the globin family. The globin family is the family of proteins that produce our hemoglobin, the protein that transports oxygen in our blood. And we have globin genes on chromosome 11 and on chromosome 16. These are two different loci we can tell that because they're on completely different chromosomes. Even though their sequences are similar, they're not on homologous chromosomes, they're on different chromosomes, they're different loci. We can expand that a bit by thinking about their allelic relationships. So on chromosome 11, we have beta globin, but we have many different alleles of the beta globin in the human population. Similarly, the alpha globin alleles on chromosome 16 come in many different alleles in the human population. These different versions of alpha globin are alleles. The different versions of beta globin are alleles, but the alpha globin and the beta globin are different loci. Now, the situation is even a little more complicated than this because, in fact, we have multiple beta globin genes. So there was an ancestral duplication after the duplication that gave rise to the alpha and beta versions. There was a later duplication that gave rise to multiple, or a series of duplications, gave rise to multiple beta globin genes that function in different tissues, for instance, embryonic and fetal tissues versus adult bloodstream. And the same for alpha globin. There are different loci. So there are four, in my drawing, four different alpha globin loci, each of which will have multiple alleles. So what we've done, we thought about the consequences of gene duplications. That if a gene duplication is directly beneficial, two copies is better than one, it's going to persist because of natural selection. If it's neutral, it can still pers persist, but the two copies are likely to diverge. One may assume a new function, or each of them may assume modified sort of subfunctions of the original function. And this has been a very effective event in evolutionary history. It has given rise to many, many of the genes in our bodies. So the human genome contains many, many gene families with different um, 
loci with different versions of ancestrally descended genes. Now, coming up next, we're going to think about how DNA sequence differences accumulate through time. And we're doing this as a preparatory step for Lecture 2P, where we're going to think about how the sequence differences that have accumulated through time can be used to let us infer how the process of evolution has actually happened. I hope to see you there.